All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Dean Wampler. I uh, work for Lightbend, which is the company behind Scala, which maybe is why I'm talking about it today. Uh, we've been su providing support for Spark on Scala for a while now, uh, and it, you know, it's our view that Scala is a perfect language for Spark, at least for developers. Data scientists uh, are still obviously preferring Python for the most part. This uh, talk is actually based on a free tutorial I wrote on GitHub, which is probably a day's work to work through, and it's designed to show you just the basics of Scala that you need to know in order to actually start writing uh, Spark code with the Scala API. And what I'm going to do today is just demo some of the highlights of um, what I really love about Scala and why I really enjoy writing Spark code in Scala. Uh, I also recently set up a Gitter channel for people who want to talk about Spark on Scala and so forth, or Scala and Spark, I guess. Uh, and you're welcome to join that as well on Gitter. So the rest of this will just be a live demo, I think. There we go. OK, so I'm actually using the Spark Notebook, which is developed in Belgium by a company called uh, uh, Datafellas. Uh, you may some, know some of them. Uh, it's, it's nice because it's already configured for Scala, and I don't need to like, set up an environment with uh, you know, mixing Scala into uh, Jython or something like that, but any of the uh, notebook environments would work. In fact, this demo is using also Spark 1.6.2. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about is equally applicable for any version of Spark. Uh, so what I'm going to do is work through this notebook and show you some code and then uh, show you how I can improve the code with uh, some of the cool features that I really like about Scala. Uh, and again, here's the link for the, the Git repo. Let's make sure this is working. There we go. So everybody does uh, word count, right, as the uh, starting, uh, you know, sample application where you just, you know, loaded corpus of documents and count all the words. That's really dull and boring. So why don't we do something slightly more interesting, which is inverted index, where we won't forget where we found the words. We'll instead build up an index of uh, you know, a list of all the words we found in the corpus where we found them, and then a count of how many times they appeared in a document. So if you were going to implement the next Google killer, this is kind of the first thing you would write. So what I'm going to start with is a data set. I pulled down some uh, you know, free versions of some of Shakespeare's plays to have a source of data. And I'm just going to, um, you know, I've already set them up in this environment. And in fact, I should say that this notebook is available in that uh, longer tutorial as well, if you want to play with it later. The data is already there. At least I think I pushed it there this morning. I'll check that afterwards. Um, so here's our first program. It's rather uh, maybe a lot to see. Actually, it fits on the slide, which is kind of nice. Well, let me get rid of this selection here. Uh, and I'm going to explain what it's doing and, uh, and then make it much more readable. So first thing to know about this is it's actually one giant expression. And you can tell that by the little dots, the periods that appear at the end of several lines. So I'm basically just building a pipeline. I'm going to read uh, these text files. Uh, what whole text files does is it actually reads all the files in a directory and it returns an RDD that has as a key the file name and then as the value the entire contents of the file. So it's very nice since I want to know what the file name is and normally we kind of forget about that sort of thing in Hadoop. Uh, this is a very great way to get this data that I need. Uh, then I'm going to run it through FlatMap, which is um, a function that's like mapping, but instead of one to one, it's zero to many as output. Uh, it actually, uh, the function that I'm passing to it actually will return a, um, uh, a, a collection. In this case, it returns a Java array of stuff. And then the arrays from each record are then flattened into one giant RDD. And what actually happens here is that, um, uh, notice the comment on the second line. When I, when I call flat map, the data that comes in will be a two-element tuple. And you can write it literally in Scala as, you know, first element, second element inside parentheses. It'll be the file name and contents, as I said. Uh, the first two things I'll do is, one, I'll pull the second element off the tuple, which is the underscore two method call. And that'll be my contents. And I'm just going to do the naive thing, split on white space, or anything that isn't alphanumeric characters. Uh, those of you who do natural language processing can complain about it later on Twitter that I'm doing it that way, because uh, it sucks. But anyway, it's good for demos. Uh, then I'm also going to just pull off the final uh, file name on the long path, because the path will all be the same, and it's just noise. So I just want the file name. That's all the second line is doing that creates this variable called file name. And then I'm going to map over the array of words I got when I split the contents. It's just a Java array. Uh, and now I'm going to use the Scala you know, map library, or rather, uh, collections library for this. I'll map over each word. I'm passing a function uh, to this method. 
and then I'm going to return a two-element tuple where the first element is itself a two-element tuple, word and file name, and then a, a seed count of one. I'm basically going to count these uh, pairs of words and file names. So notice how easy it is to write a tuple in Scala. I don't have to do like new tuple, factory manager, decomposer, reconstructor, factory pattern if, if you use Spring. I can just uh, you know, write something like this and then it, it automatically instantiates the objects I want. And it's readable, which is really important. So this key then will be our word and file name. We're going to do a, the equivalent of a group by statement next on that and then actually sum up all of those ones to get the count per document, per word, for, uh, for each of those words. And that's what the next line after the two comment lines does. The reduce by key is an optimized group by that's just going to sum up those counts, but uh, based on each group of word file name, you know, each unique combination. And then the last, or the next step, rather, is um, uh, this is the one that I'm, I, I actually absolutely love to clean up because it's completely opaque what I'm doing, but I'm actually just uh, re uh, configuring the tuple a little bit so that now I just have the word as the key, and then the value will be the file name and count uh, as a nested tuple. Then I'm going to do a real group by to actually extract um, you know, all the unique words and then a, a sequence of these file name path, file, or file name count, file name counts. Uh, then I'll sort those ascending. You know, basically, we're done at this point, but now we're doing a little cleanup for a you know, nice presentation. And then the last step is a, a map over the values. I don't need to change the keys. I just want to pass a function that takes the values. It's some sort of sequence or iterable object. Uh, and now in this, in this function, I'm just doing Scala collection stuff to... Um, Basically, I want to sort by the count descending. So if you know, if you're doing a search in Google or anything like that, you obviously want to see the documents that are most relevant to what you're searching for. And here I'm going to assume that higher counts mean higher relevancy. So I want to sort descending by these counts. So I, you know, in each record, I'm just rearranging the sequence, the, the value part, and then uh, at the end making a string out of that sequence just for convenience. So the final output will be another tuple, two element tuple, with a word and then a string that has these um, pairs of file name count, file name count, et cetera. Okay, so that's all it's doing. Um, uh, if you've done any functional programming or worked with you know, libraries in Python or Scala, it's actually really fast to write this code because uh, you, you kind of have this toolbox and you, you, you can crank it out very quickly, experiment with it, refine it. There's a lot we can do here to refine this. Uh, but still, I'm not happy with this because I don't think it's as obviously readable as it can be. And I'm going to show you my favorite feature in Scala to prove that it can be a lot more readable. But uh, let's make sure this runs. It actually compiled. That's great news. And then we'll see the first um, 20 or so lines. So I'm just going to take the first 20 records and then print them, one, one per line. For each is like you know, a, a for loop. Uh, and then I just pass the print line or print line function to it to print one. And you can see that... One of the things we get that's ugly is somehow we ended up with the, the empty string is being counted. Uh, there's uh, technical reasons why that happened. We'll actually get rid of that in a minute. Uh, and also, it's not really a good idea that to mix or to have uppercase words be unique compared to lowercase or mixed case. The reason we have these uppercase names is if you've ever read like a play folio, they always put the characters in uppercase when they're showing who's saying what. So we'll get rid of that too. We'll just convert to lowercase. So what I've done here in the next line is uh, uh, basically copied all of the, that code over, and I'm just going to go through and clean it up uh, using my favorite feature, which is pattern matching. And at the same time, I'll do things like get rid of that blank line uh, and convert to lowercase. OK. Let's see. So uh, we're going to read in the files as before, this whole text file. Now, I said that we have this two-element tuple, and I use this rather verbose name as the argument to my nested anonymous function to uh, kind of make it somewhat clear what it is, but I can make it a whole lot clearer by using pattern matching. So if you, use, if you pass a function with, with a sequence of statements like this, case and then tuple, which will be file name and contents, what that does is it, I know that I'm passing a two-element tuple. If, if I didn't know exactly what I was passing in here, I'd have to have like a default clause. In this case, I know what I've got. So it's going to say, ah, you've got a two-element tuple. I'm going to rip it apart and assign the first field to this file name variable, the second field to the contents variable. And then instead of this ugly thing where I reference the second element of the tuple, I can just replace that with contents. And I can do the same thing here with uh, file name or file name, 
And everything else is the same. We still use the same literal syntax to instantiate a new tuple. And again, that this last bit words map, that's creating a nested array of these tuples that will then get flattened into a big um, RDD. But I hope you can see that this is now a little bit more readable than it was before. I know that I've got a file name and contents, and I'm just playing with the variables directly. Oops, I missed something. Had to get rid of this stout, underscore one. OK? Uh, there, there's nothing to change here. This is literally uh, from reduced by key. It is a function that takes two arguments, and so there's nothing to change here. No pattern matching required. But here's the one I really love to fix. And what I'm going to do, is just to be able to compare them, I'm going to copy and the first line and just use that and then comment out the rest so that we can compare. But uh, now what I'm going to do is, this is going to be case, and uh, remember we just did this transformation. We have this nested uh, tuple as a key, and it's um, you know word, file name, that's the key, and then the count is uh, the value part. And here's what I'm actually building, and hopefully it'll just jump right out at you when you see this. All I'm doing is moving the parentheses. That's all this statement really did, but it had this ugly nested tuple syntax, or rather, you know, calling methods on tuples that really obscured the meaning. I absolutely love this line, and I harp on it all the time when I show people this, because for me, this is like, it's thrilling. You know, you get this little endorphin hit. When you see stuff like this where you know that, OK, I'm getting ready to get the final format, which is I want to have the words as keys and then a collection of file name counts. But at the moment, I've got file name and as part of the uh, key, so I just need to move the parentheses to get what I really want. And you can just write it down exactly the way you thought of it. So for me, this is really just wonderful code to be able to write. You can write it in you know, 10 seconds, however long it takes to type it. You don't have to think about you know, converting to some API with methods and stuff like that. So I really love this. Maybe you can tell. Um, all right, we did the group by key. So now it's hopefully even clear that we're grouping over the words to get all the unique words together. Uh, you know, in other words, one record per, per word. Uh, the same sort doesn't change. Uh, and then the only change down here, this iterable is just a single argument. We don't need to change that, but we can use pattern matching here. So I'll go ahead and use case. Um, and this was, oops, what did I, I forgot what I had here. Oh yeah, file, and it's the file name and the count. These are the nested count. Uh, or file name count pairs. So I'll do case, file name count. And then now I can make this a lot simpler. This is just the count. And I'll, I sort of glossed over what this is really doing. Now I'll explain it in more detail. So what this Scala collections method says is, all right, I'm going to pass you each record, return something that I can then sort in the natural way and to give you the ordering that you want. So if I take the negative of the count, it will basically do a descending count rather than ascending. And then it just for you know, grins, I put in the file name as a second, sort of secondary sort. That's also useful if you're writing a unit test for this to make sure the file names always show up in the same order when you're trying to compare against golden data or something. But anyway, hopefully that you can see by using this pattern matching syntax, I've cleaned up the code a lot. I've made it a lot more easy to read, at least once you understand what this uh, syntax is doing, that I'm setting up a pattern matching operation. Um, and then it, it just kind of falls out more, more naturally. And I'll show another example of this in a minute when I talk about case classes, uh, a way of declaring types in Scala. But uh, hopefully you can appreciate you know, the value of this. Now, oh, I, so I screwed up something here. Let's see. File name needs type. Um, I wonder what, oh, you know what else I forgot to do? Let me fix this while I'm at it. I forgot to filter out the empty thing, so I'm just going to put in a, a, an extra filter clause here. And filtering is, what do I want to keep? I want the words to have a length that's greater than zero, so this will get rid of that empty word case. And also, for this, I wanted to convert all the words to lower case, so I'll just do that here. Now, this error. Let's separate our last. Uh, let's see. File name contents. Let's try it again. Probably have the same error. I found value word. Oh, here's another typo. It's always great to live code, isn't it? So what, you know, one nice thing about these notebooks, of course, is I can just keep uh, you know, retrying, the, edit the code, and retry it. 
And I don't really see what's wrong at the moment. Oh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So let's just use two here. I, I use the same variable name twice, so I'll just change it in one place. There it goes. Now it's happy. And actually, the results are a little different because now we're mixing lower and upper case together, so we've actually changed the output, but this is probably more what we want to, to not really think about case. But you can see also that we got rid of the empty example. Okay. All right, so uh, hopefully you can appreciate that using pattern matching is really a cool thing, something you don't have in Java. And that's, to be fair, Java 8 added you know, anonymous functions. That fixed a massive problem with using Java for Spark. Uh, if you've all seen the book Learning Spark from O'Reilly, they give examples in Java 7, Scala, and Python. And the Scala and Python examples are always you know, really small like this, and then the Java ones run for pages uh, because they, they, they were using you know, pre-Java 8 uh, non-Lambda code. But, uh, so that's, that's a nice thing that they fixed, but still there's things like pattern matching that are really nice. And I want to mention two other things while I have the time. The first one is that we'd get the safety of static typing, which is something that you know, Java people tend to like, but we don't have to add all the type signature stuff. It, most of the time, but not all the time, it's inferred for us. I really haven't put any type information in any of the code we've seen. But also, it can be really nice for feedback. This is actually the thing I miss the most when I use the Python API. If I'm not exactly sure what I just created, like in an RDD transformation, I usually have to like, print out a few records to see what I got. But now I'll actually be able to see just from the type signature that's inferred by the Scala interpreter. So if I run, the, just the, what I'm doing is I took the first uh, couple of steps of this transformation through the reduce by a key. And you, look at this now. I know just by the output that I have an RDD with a two-element tuple as the record type, and the first element is this key type of string and string. And it's also useful to know that it's counting with integers and not longs, for example. So we get that kind of stuff for free, and that can be really handy, especially learning, but also just kind of sanity checking what you're doing, and also catching trivial errors that the, the type system can do for you when you're developing your code. The last thing I want to talk about is this notion of case classes. This is a, it gives us a couple of benefits. Uh, notice how I'm declaring this. Uh, basically, I'm going to declare a type to represent the output of this reduced by key, just as an example. And I'll just call it step record because I called uh, this RDD steps. Uh, couldn't come up with a better name, in other words. But uh, so what's, what does this mean here? I have this case keyword, and then I have this uh, type name, and then I have a list of arguments afterwards. So in Scala, when you declare a class, the argument list for the primary constructor goes right after the name of the class, because the body is actually the primary constructor of the class. And there's ways to do secondary constructors and all that, but we don't need to get into it. The case keyword does a whole lot of stuff for us. First of all, it makes this argument list. All of these things are automatically made immutable values, or fields, in the, in the object. So there's none of this boilerplate for getters and setters that's required. It's just done for me by the compiler. And then I'm going to, just as an example, I'm going to embed a method in here that I'll use to, this would be like a two-string method, but it, instead it's going to write JSON strings, for, just for, for grins. And I'm using another feature that I really like in Scala, which is, uh, it's actually d two features. It's triple-quoted strings and interpolated strings. The S makes them interpolated, meaning I can embed expressions or variable names, and they'll just get expanded into the string. So it's a nice way to format strings. The triple quotes are nice because then I can easily embed single quotes and so forth without escaping them with a backslash. So that's pretty convenient. So let's uh, make sure this compiles. All right, that's good. Uh, now I'm going to do a, um, take my steps output and transform it into the step record. Uh, you'll notice there's no keyword new here. There's actually a factory method that was also created. So I can just say step record, argument list, get an object for it. Notice what it says for the type of the records now. They're step records. If we look at the first few, it prints out the two-string. Is, this is actually the auto-generated two-string method. It also does equals and hash code for me, which is really nice. These are great things to use for keys in, in records, like for sorting and hash maps. Uh, and now let's see what the output is if I do that, call that two-string method or two-json string. Now the type is string for my records. And if I print this, then I, you can see I get JSON output. So nice and convenient. 
Um, but now, the, the, fa the last thing I want to show you is how, really the reason the word case is used, that, that keyword is used when I declared this, is not just to get all this other stuff, but it also generates functions that are used to do pattern matching. So there's like a protocol that the language defines that if you implement the right methods behind the scenes, you can actually do pattern matching with this stuff. So what I'm going to do is map over this steps two, which is the output of this, uh, sorry, up here. So this is the data where all the records are this step record uh, type. Uh, and I'm going to map on them and then use the same pattern matching expression where I expect to find a step record object. I'm going to pull out the word. I'm going to pull out the count. And I'm using underscore to say I don't want to see the file name. I'm just going to throw it away. And actually, what I'm implementing is word count. So I lied a little bit earlier, and I am actually implementing word count. So I'm throwing away the file name. I'm just going to return a two-element tuple with the word and the count. I'll do the same reduce by key that we did earlier. Oh, I forgot to mention, I didn't do this. This is a shorthand way of writing uh, this, like count one, count two, count uh, one plus count two. It really makes people mad when they see this for the first time because it's like line noise. It's completely opaque. But once you get used to what's going on, or you're, I'm just using underscores as placeholders for each variable one at a time, then it becomes like a token. You see this, and you know immediately I'm just adding things. Or if I put in star, you know that I'm just multiplying things. So that's why this is actually a really nice shorthand for this more verbose way of writing the same function, because it's, it's so concise. You know, I rip it out in three characters. I added a couple of spaces, and I'm done. And once, I, once I'm used to seeing this all the time, I just see it as you know, a token that I recognize immediately. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, I want to sort by the count descending. So, um, so I'm going to uh, use the key by method to say, all right, sort by count, and we'll, we'll do it. Uh, here we'll say, I want to sort descending by passing this uh, named parameter ascending to be false when I do sort by key. Let's run that. And then let's look at the outputs. Here we'll look at the first 100 records. And there we have it. So it turns out stop words like I and the and and, as you might imagine, are the most commonly occurring words in Shakespeare. Uh, and then if you scroll down a little bit, I think you'll start to see words that are maybe more meaningful, like love. We all know about Shakespeare's all about love, actually. Um, uh, and mistress, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's about love, too, and, and so forth. And, and old English words like hath. And if we went farther, you'd start to see names like Hamlet and stuff like that. OK, that's, that's all I have. Uh, let me go back to the slides, if we can, and uh, just to put the URLs back up. And then I'll take your questions. All right, thank you. Uh, one other link on here is uh, if you want to know more about what, what Lightbend's doing with uh, streaming pipelines or Spark in general, go to the Fast Data Platform link. But for now, any questions? Uh, so just for everybody, uh, the question mics are there and there. And as a reminder, please get very close to the mic. Stunned silence. All right, well, if nobody has a question, let's give one more round of applause. All right, thank you.